Oh yeah. All right, welcome everyone to the uh, seventh session of the Small Grains for Brewing and Distilling and Craft Beverages Happy Hour. Um, this week we are shining a spotlight on the Michigan Craft Beverage Council and we're here speaking with Janelle Jaglin, the director of the Craft Beverage Council. And then we'll hear from Dr. Dean Boz afterwards. Um, so it's all about how um, the Craft Beverage Council supports research that directly benefits agricultural producers and agricultural value chains in the context of craft beer and spirits and wine and cider. Um, so I'll stop belaboring that point and hand it over to you, Janelle. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you um, both Dean and Ryan for giving me the opportunity. I appreciate being here. Um, and I, you know, I know we have a few people on the call and I'm not necessarily sure where um, all of our attendees, like where they are on the value supply chain or how familiar you are with Craft Beverage Council already. So forgive me, I'm gonna give a little bit of background information about the council. If this is information you already know or have heard from me, I apologize for the redundancy. But so the Craft Beverage Council, we're a, um, we're a program within the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. <clears throat> and this program was sort of born out of, you know, the phoenix out of the ashes of the Grape and Wine Council, which was a program of the department um, since the mid 80s. And so on October 1st, 2018, it was legislated that this change would occur. Um, and so it changed the scope of the council. So we expanded <clears throat> who were serving from grape and wine producers to include craft distilleries, breweries, cideries, as you mentioned. Um, our funding structure remained the same. It's, uh, we are funded out of non-retail liquor license fees. And um, so it's really just an industry funded program. <clears throat> And also, of course, it's expanded the scope of, you know, the, our interests and what we're, you know, how we're hoping to make a difference. So we're a 10 member uh, governor appointed council and terms are three years. Um, we just actually welcomed a new council member on October. And we also were happy to re-welcome Larry Bell and Scott Graham uh, as they were reappointed to their seats. And so this just gives a quick kind of overview of the people that do sit on the council and also the areas that they're representing. You see that we have winemakers, uh, restaurants that have this um, Class C license, microbrewers, small distillers. Uh, we have a large distiller seat and a large brewer seat. And so you see that by the makeup of this council, we're really you know, <clears throat> we're, we're seeing the whole gamut of all different, you know, diverse interests large and small, different industry sectors being represented here. But one thing I've noticed since the beginning of this council is that there's always a spirit of collaboration. And at every single meeting that I've, you know, been able to take part in, the goal is to, you know, have that rising tide that lifts all boats, even if it isn't in the interest of everybody in the council. So, <clears throat> so it's, it's a really good group of people they're very interested in having impact on the industry. And so I guess with the next couple of slides, I'll kind of talk about some of the things that we do to try to get to that impact. When we went through, you know, 2018, so that was not that long ago. And, and when we first formed, we went through, a, you know, a period of sort of self-reflection, creating our brand story. And what is it that we wanted to do with, uh, with our time and efforts. And so we, we kind of broke it through our marketing firm. We broke our work into four main buckets. And there's going to be research. Um, anything that's bucketed under the grow is how in the department you can sort of like leverage our place within the department to help, you know, facilitate connections with growers and also just to help support the growers in the state that are supporting the craft beverage producers. Um, there's a crafting element, which is, you know, the actual production of the craft beverages. And so that can be licensing support, any sort of business development activities, maybe helping to link businesses to other grant opportunities, not necessarily from our research grant program, but other business development grants. 
And then of course, you know, you can't have this without the consumer <laughs> element. So the drink bucket brings in the consumers in, into the whole fold. And so when we first uh, started this council, it was written into legislation that a majority of our, a good majority of our funding would go toward the research program. And so that's sort of where we've been really hanging our hat the last couple of years. And I'll go more into that in just, um, just a minute. But I wanted to also share some of the other things that we do. You know, as, as, um, as a council and as a program, we're able to help promote the statewide industry. We're here for stakeholder engagement, partner meetings. Uh, we're here to offer a marketplace. We have this really cool marketplace on our website where we're connecting growers and producers. In fact, we also have equipment on there. So if, if anybody on the, on the call here is looking to list or purchase items, we do make sure that any of the ag items that are listed on our marketplace are grown in Michigan, but we are allowing out of state uh, equipment suppliers for things that we potentially might not have in state right now. <clears throat> As a program, we're able to, you know, keep statistics and make sure that we're abreast of what's going on in the industry, the licensing numbers. We have communication efforts. We've put out an e-newsletter e now. Um, and that membership continues to grow. We have social media accounts. We just, we kind of are in that place in the, you know, in the middle where like, if you have a question for something, if I don't have the answer, I know exactly who to point you to to get to the answer. So it's really about connectivity with this program. And that's probably one of my favorite parts about it. So as I mentioned previously, the research is a huge part of our program. And I have these years here to, to kind of reference. So in 2018, you have to remember that's when we were still primarily the grape and wine industry program. And at that time, they had eight projects totaling $135,000 in research for the entire year. And then compare that to 2019 and 2020 and see that amount of investment that we've really been able to increase and um, invest in the research into the program. And of course, you know that that also means that in 2018, the research all focused on grape and wine related issues primarily and cider, of course. Um, and then in 2019 and 2020, we were able to welcome this whole new branch of research, including hop, barley, grain, all of these things that we, we hadn't really been you know, they weren't part of the fold before. So there's been a learning curve with that. You know, we had to try to continually try to readjust every year to make sure that we are doing, a, you know, a service to the, to the research and make sure that we're making it as useful and fair as possible. Everybody uh, that we're trying to support, have, they have different growing seasons, as I'm sure you guys all know. And so trying to figure out what the fiscal year for this research grant program looks like it's been a little bit of a challenge and we appreciate everybody's patience as we kind of wrap our hands around it. But so one of the other things that's very exciting to us is not only just to be able to fund this research and invest in all of these cool new innovative ways of looking at craft beverage production, but to make sure that this research is available to everybody for use. We don't want research that's going to sit on an internet shelf and get dusty. We want it to be used. And so one of the components of our new website is the research database where you can search everything that, uh, that we've come received as final reports um, by keyword, by category, by researcher, um, all sorts of ways that you can slice and dice ways to search our research and see what, um, what our research of researchers have come up with. I wanted to list the grain specific research projects that were funded in the 2020 um, research program. So these projects are all currently underway right now um, in various cycles of planting, harvesting or analyzing. I don't know if anybody on the call has any specific questions about any of these projects. We could we could break here now or we could come back to it. I think I only have one 
one or two more slides after this one, but what, what is your preference, Ryan? How would you like to move forward past this one? Um, we can wait till the end. Uh, Dean's definitely on the call. Um, and then it looks like Brooke has joined us too. Um, so. Um, if, okay, yeah. if there are questions, then maybe the researchers can help fill in some of the gaps. Yep. Okay. So I know that this is um, a pretty intimate call right now. We have just a handful of us on here, but I'm I'm interested, you know, it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to share what we do as a craft beverage council, but I, I think one of the things that I'm most interested in is hearing from the audience and who are you, why are you on this call, like what is your interest in the craft beverage, so what, where are you in the supply chain and, and what do you feel like you need in terms of support from, from a statewide program or in general in Michigan's craft beverage uh, growth the growth of our industry. Um, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I feel like I would really like to have a little bit of a conversation. So I don't know, Drew, if would you be interested in kind of sharing what, what you're here for? Um, sure, uh, I'm, I'm here for as a representative of independent barley and malt. And um, could you go back one slide? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and Michael, he's on the call as well. Uh, he said you can unmute him. I think it's a 734 number. Um, but I'm definitely interested in uh, the role of planting date and seeding rate in optimizing winter survival yield and quality of malting barley by Dr. Singh. Okay. Um, and, and that researcher is definitely not on the call. I don't know if Brooke, you have, Brooke or Dean, do you have any experience with the research that's being conducted right now? Yeah, I, I know Manny quite well and work with him quite a bit. Um, so, and, and I know, Drew, you're probably somewhat familiar with what's going on there. So I don't want to yeah, repeat yeah. more than what you know. Um, but are there specific things you wanted to talk about related to it? Because I could, I could go on and on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that's awesome. No, I'm just kind of, kind of interested in what, uh, what's going on in the future with that. Um, yeah. So I know um, Manny is, uh, you know, that that's a pretty basic, straightforward trial, but he's got a couple of proposals to, like the USDA um, that he's partnering with some other people more regionally to look at barley agronomy, both for the barley itself, but how it fits into a cropping system as well, and what, what benefits it can bring to the system and so forth. So I think that his, his larger goal is to, you know, think bigger for barley and in, in terms of more in, in terms of how it can be used more broadly. So that's kind of the, the big picture. But you know, along the way, I think what we're learning is that every variety um, that we're thinking about using for malting needs to have its own rigorous research on agronomy because of the differential results that we find depending on, you know, for example, we, we did a, plant, a simple planting rate trial a couple of years ago with a couple of different varieties and they had pretty different results. And so I think, but I'll stop there instead of just taking over this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brett. Hey, Michael Cooper here, also from Independent Barley and Malt. We appreciate the MSU team and Janelle bringing this forward always. Uh, I, I think to reiterate, what uh, Brooks said, for us, it's gonna be, uh, it, and we've mentioned this before, I'm sorry, the long-term data that's gonna be necessary. So our our team is, uh, can only make choices uh, with data. And so I have to be able to deliver that over time. So super excited to 
you know, have a, a flag in the ground where we can start adding on uh, annualized uh, data, particularly on the uh, agronomic. But I also uh, think that it's probably more difficult under COVID that we, we uh, need to work harder uh, as a team to be able to uh, disseminate the value of the research to the true consumer, which is going to be this um, an, uh, a craft beer who, uh, artist who's really thinking about uh, the terroir, uh, the origin of that product, the, uh, the grower of that product, and then the processor of that product. So I think uh, it was going to be real critical uh, how we uh, communicate effectively uh, all the success uh, data collection that we're doing and how it impacts the brewers and distillers and other people who use grains. Hey Michael, this is Janelle. Um, when you're saying long-term data is necessary, how, how long-term is long-term for you? Wow, well that would, I, I'd have to throw that back to, to kindly to Brooke and everybody else. To really, you know, because again, just like you said, two seasons and we had, so uh, we're getting good data. I, just, I, I don't want to minimize particularly the most recent uh, nitrogen phosphorus studies uh, with the wheat uh, because 96 samples will get you a lot of data. And uh, so, but can anyone else, um, is there a real number there, Ryan? I, I can I can kind of jump in on that one a little bit. I think, you know, typically we like to see a minimum of about three years so that we get hopefully um, a, some differences in climate because that's kind of the unknown. You've got a one or a two year study and you happen to get two dry years. Well, what's it look like in a wet year. So um, I think a lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of, of programs out there are three year type funding cycles. USDA has some longer ones, but um, we try to, we like to repeat at least three years. And I would say ideally five to six to get a good distribution, but a minimum of three. I don't know what you think, Brooke, but um, you know, that, that's really the, the wild card out there is the, the types of years you get during the study so that you can make, you, so your recommendations to farmers um, will hold over a range of climate conditions and what they might encounter in production. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, it depends on the context that you're giving a recommendation um, for. But if a grower asks me what barley I think they should plant, um, I don't feel comfortable with anything less than three or four years. But even then, I'll state like, well, we have three or four years of variety trial data. And I think this variety um, is a good choice based on that. But yeah, I'd, I'd be a lot more comfortable with double that <laughs> um, reaching back. Um, but yeah, it, weather patterns that we're seeing, um, I don't think there really is any normal. Um, and it's hard to really put a pin in an average anymore. Um, so yeah, the more the merrier when it comes to data acquisition. Yeah, right? and I think the one of the things that lengthens that in this case is because of the additional quality attributes that are required. Um, if you're just looking at, you know, yield, which um, with a fair amount of commodities, yield tends to be the primary driver and you wanna identify high yielding varieties over a range of, of years, um, you probably don't need quite as much data, but when you start throwing in some of the quality aspects and the impact that wet years and dry years can have on, on the quality of the product that um, would be, it would be better to have more 
variability in your conditions to be able to judge what might be best to deliver the quality as well as yield. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to shift a little bit. We have a guest on the call um, who is from the Artisan Grain Collaborative, um, Alyssa Hartman. Um, so Alyssa, if you'd like to chime in and introduce yourself. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to hear from, some, from someone outside of Michigan that uh, can tell us about, about what's going on in the collaborative order. Yeah, hi, everybody. And I think probably many of us have a mutual friend in Ashley McFarland. I've heard lots of your names from her. So it's nice to finally <laughs> put uh, Dean in particular, your face with a uh -oh. name that I've heard <laughs> often and with uh, much fanfare. <laughs> I have oh, to say, God. too, she's, she speaks highly of you and you too, Brooke. Um, but yeah, I'm the director of the Artisan Grain Collaborative. I'm personally based in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, but members of the collaborative, we now have upwards of 120, are based all over the upper Midwest and including folks in Michigan. And we are a network of farmers, millers, maltsters, bakers, chefs, brewers, distillers, agricultural researchers, support organizations, um, trying to pull together as many folks as possible from the uh, small grains value chain in hopes of bringing together stakeholders, solving for problems, and we're really focused on increasing access to markets for food grade small grains as an opportun opportunity to diversify crop rotations in the region to enhance farm viability, um, and then also to increase food security in the upper Midwest as well. So I'm glad to be here. We have a brewing and distilling working group that's part of the collaborative um, that, as you would expect, a lot of what we talk about is related to barley and the many um, challenges and opportunities we have in this region uh, to see more um, barley on the landscape. So glad to be here with you all and to know that this is happening. And in fact, Ryan and the Michigan Barley Association is the Artisan Grain Collaborative's newest member. So we have some official cross-pollination in that way too. Yeah. So yeah, glad to be here. I am looking at this list of all these folks, like what an amazing set of resources. Um, and I hope that you all will think of me as a resource as well, if there's things that I can do to support the um, getting your research out to more folks in the upper Midwest, happy to do that and glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and yay, I, yay for me being the newest member <clears throat> of the collaborative. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, does anyone else uh, would like to uh, introduce themselves on the call? All right. Well, um, we got excellent participation, Janelle. I want you to know that like, we usually <laughs> don't, don't get such so it's broad reach of participation on this. It's because I called Drew out. I it, it wasn't fair of me. I'm sorry, Drew. That's all right. I'm fine with it. <laughs> Are you ready for me to stop sharing my screen, Ryan? Or um... sure. Um, yeah, I was gonna call on Dean. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna call Dean. Well, out. I got a few questions for you, Janelle. Before I jump in, I, I was just curious how. So the council members are appointed by the governor, right? Correct. How, how do people get to the point of being considered for appointment? Where, where, where do candidates come from or how's that? Is there a process to that or just curious? Well, um, so there's, I'm just on the like michigan.gov website, there's a, under the boards and councils page there, you know, they list all of the councils and then there's a pretty from what I've gathered, intense application um, that you put in. How people know when seats are up and how people choose to apply for the council, that I'm not as familiar with. I mean, it might be uh, kind of more industry led where certain folks might tell their colleague like, hey, this position is coming up soon. You might want to have an eye out for it. Um, I certainly didn't like put out a press release that the positions right. that, you know, that certain positions were coming up. So I think it's people who have an eye on council seats kind of, kind of know when things are coming up and, and take an opportunity to throw their name in the hat. 
so that it's pretty similar to like the corn growers and those other other groups where they're appointed by the governor and yeah they bring forward a list of because i have gotten calls from you know, we need someone for the wheat board in this part of Michigan. Do you know of a farmer who might be? Sure, so right. I'm guessing it's kind of that same type of process. Yeah. Yeah. So did the, um, when they added in the brewers and distillers and the other categories, I'm assuming that brought in additional money? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, so, so the grape folks got all the money before. Uh, yes, yep. The grape, the grape program was the recipient of those uh, non-retail liquor license fees before. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it, they did great work in 1985. Ooh, were seven. There were either seven or 14 wineries in the state, and when the program changed, we know that there were at least 148 wineries using majority Michigan fruit in the state. So it is my opinion that that money went um, to really good use for those years and, and, will, and yeah. continues to do so. So yeah. And then my last question is what what are all the beverage categories or is there like um, what about hard ciders? Is that part of this? Yes, or, absolutely. So. And hard cider is actually licensed as a, as a wine. So hard ciders okay. also received the benefit of the grape and wine program for those years, although there probably wasn't enough emphasis put on hard ciders um, at the time. So they're getting a little bit more um, attention probably right now, just because in some you know, I think in some ways the consumer lumps hard cider in closer to beer than they do wine. And so as we expanded the scope of the council, I think it did um, just naturally let cider get a little bit more attention. Mm -hmm. Are there, cider? Is there anything else I'm, I'm just not thinking top of my head that falls in, you know, so beer, liquor, mead, hard ciders, wine. What'd mead is not one that um, <laughs> mead is not one that we cover, and I'm tr and I'm hoping that I understand. Like, if a mead has a certain amount of grape or fruit in it, then yes, it is something that would be covered under our program. Hmm. Hmm. That is interesting. And I can't remember what the term is. It's a specific type of mead that would have. Uh, Mellow Mallow is fruited mead, uh, whereas Methaglin is herbed mead. Um, and then there's Braggot, which is a kind of a beer mead hybrid. So there's mm -hmm. grain, mash, and, and honey. But um, that's interesting, though. Uh, um, like the promotion of getting more pollinators out there and honeybees and everything, I think is pretty important. But um, yeah, I would agree. Interesting stuff. Cider to me is super interesting, too, because um, it occupies this area somewhere between like blue collarness of beer and like slightly not as blue collar of wine um, culturally, but they have like the ultimate secondary market for apples. Um, oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, they also have that benefit of it, in most cases being rural. So they fit along with agritourism um, and those peak seasons. So where people really just want to get out into the orchards or get out and visit these businesses. So. Yeah, I, it's hard to pick your favorite child, but I think that probably hard cider is um, kind of my favorite category these days. <laughs> <laughs> have any of you it. been up to tandem ciders? I have not, no. I hey. just got married in September and my uh, now husband and I went up to Leelanau County for our honeymoon and they had the coolest COVID pivot of any kind of food or huh. beverage establishment I've seen. Um, they, they operate out of a big barn and they had closed that, nobody could come in, but they had a little window that you could come pick up from. And we got married the first week of September. So it was around, you know, good peak apple season. 
and they had scattered picnic tables all throughout their orchard. So you were in this like beautiful, private, mm. secluded, like you could kind of hear other people talking, but you couldn't see anyone. And you were just surrounded by apple trees. And I would highly recommend that everyone go there. It's a very lovely place. And we just finished our last bottle of cider from there last week, which was bittersweet. I have to order more now, but they're very cool. Well, congratulations on getting married. And yeah. I'm really glad you came here. That's awesome. Yeah, we were going to be in France, but might as well be in Michigan, right? The France of the Midwest. <laughs> Very similar, similar parallel. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. It was fun, but I'm with you. I'm on team cider too, Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa, I feel like you and I should connect offline. Let's do it. Okay. Also, don't tell my brewers and distillers that I'm on team cider, please. <laughs> that would not bode well, I don't think. I'm definitely supposed to be team grain. So. <laughs> Well, speaking of Team Grain, uh, Dean, I believe your name was attached yeah. to that Rye for Distilling study. Uh, yeah, that was good, Ryan. Nice, nice transition. It's, that was a nice pivot. <laughs> I don't, I, <laughs> I don't have a lot. What, I, what I kind of wanted to share with the group is um, wanted to give you just a, a little bit of a rundown on kind of what has taken through the years to keep all this going. Um, you know, I think there's people out there that think, you know, universities just have money laying around and we do what we want, but <laughs> that's really not the case. We usually, we have to find our funding. And um, so I've got one slide here just to give you a, uh, if I can get at the spot here for make it full screen. There we go. So I just, th this is just a, a quick uh, list of the funding that we've gotten since we kind of jumped into this working in barley and cereal rye and uh, the- I think, I think you have to change your display settings. We're on the- Oh, hold on. Here. Yeah, it's on my other. How's it? There we go. Does that work? Almost. There we go. Okay, got it. Yep. So I, this, I know this is really hard to read, and I don't expect you to read all the different uh, different projects. But we've had twenty four. We've had funding from twenty four different sources since twenty fourteen, and these are are uh, grouped uh, just in alphabetical order by the different uh, different organizations. Um, and you can see we have uh, American Malt and Barley Association, Craft Beverage Council. There's an MDAR grant in there. There was a sustainable ag research and education uh, program grant, um, money from uh, North Dakota State that comes through the US Brewers Association. Um, we've had some project green funds. Um, there's USDA grants. And, uh, but the thing to note here is, you know, we put this together. A lot of these are under $10,000 grants. Um, you know, there's a lot of 5,000, 7,000, 6,000, you know, so we, we basically um, get this money. Um, a lot of it we have to apply for every year. It's a, it's on an annual basis. And, but I just, and I may have missed a few here. Um, hopefully not, but I went through uh, the MSU system and you can see we've, we've totaled over $400,000 um, in that about seven year period. Um, so this is the type of thing we do on a regular basis. A lot of you help us out. You know, we really value your help when we need to write a grant and we need a supporting letter from someone in industry. Um, it, it's your help that uh, helps us get this funding. Uh, most funders like to see that there's stakeholders that are interested in what we're proposing. So I just wanted to, to uh, give a shout out to everybody that, that's written us a, a letter of support in the past. Um, the other thing I would point out is that for every one of these that you see, we had to write a proposal. So we do, we do put time into uh, writing proposals to try to get this money. And I don't have on the list here all the proposals that we wrote that didn't get funded. So we don't get funded for everything that we put proposals in for. So. Um, 
I don't know if anybody has any questions about some of these, um, kind of how this works, but um, that was basically what I wanted to do is kind of acknowledge all the, all the organizations that have given us support, including the Craft Beverage Council um, and other organizations. And just to give you a feel for, for what it takes for us to, to keep, this, keep this program going and keep the research going. And uh, that's uh, pretty much what I've got. If anybody's got any questions for me. Um, I have one quick question about the ESBN, the Eastern Spring Barley Nursery. Um, yeah. That's been discontinued, correct? For 2021? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. As, as far as I know. Um, um, we've been doing it for seven years here in Michigan, I think, since 2013. We have. Yeah. And uh, so I think we're going to have to potentially look for some other sources of funding if we want to keep involved in that. I don't know what their plans are as far as other locations. I guess we'll, we'll see how that evolves. Um, do you know if Kevin Smith is still doing the winter malting barley trials next year? As, yeah, as far as I know, I okay. think, Brooke, did, have you talked to Kevin lately? Didn't, weren't you going to get in touch with him? Yeah, um, we're continuing the winter malting barley trials as normal. And actually that trial is a combination of varieties that are put together by Minnesota. And we also get a handful from uh, Virginia as well through a sort of a program that they're administering. And then we supplement with some other commercial varieties that don't make either of those. And then we're also starting to test some of the breeding lines from Kevin Smith's lab that are, you know, pre-market to give them another site to explore. And they're, they're kind of pivoting to go from two, uh, six row to two row with their winter barley and uh, still trying to prioritize winter hardiness, but, but kind of transitioning on the fly. If anyone is interested, Kevin recently gave a presentation for AGC's Brewing and Distilling Working Group on the current status of his research, and I did record it. Should I send it to you, Ryan, in case anyone wants to see it? Yeah, please do. I'd love yeah, to check sure. it out. Are you all involved in the Oregon State Holus Barley Project, the Naked Barley thing? Um, no, I've talked to Bridget Mines a bit about it, um, but it's been a while since we chatted about it. But um, I think okay. she's working on not only Hollis, or, but it's also organic, I think, are her Correct. trials. Yeah, yeah, I think you're that, right. I think it's an OREI. Yeah, um, we both kind of, the, where we left the conversation was that it probably spells certain doom <laughs> here uh, as far as like fungal pathogens go, but sure. Um, it's something I'd love to see because we can't crack the, the food market for barley without Hollis necessarily. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, it's always something I'd like to revisit and talk about. So it might make sense in the future um, as a small project to begin with. So the only variety that's Hollis that we've had in our trials is called a Maze 10. And I can't remember where it, where it has come from but that's been, I think that's been part of the Virginia group of varieties that's been released to us to try, so. Interesting, okay. If, uh, and I, I know it's in the trial again this year, and I believe last year was, or maybe two years ago was the first time. I'll have to dig up those variety trial results. Um, there is one brewer in Michigan who operates a mash filter. So he would be able to brew with it um, as a base malt um, being hullless. I've, I have, so I'm glad you brought that up though, because I have had this sort of passing conversations with people at uh, Kellogg company in the past about, you know, thinking about do they use barley as a food ingredient in their products and 
what potential might there be to grow barley geared at the food industry. And I haven't really gotten to talk to the right person there, but, you know, given that we do have a pretty big industry in our area for, uh, you know, food products like that, um, I, I can't help but wonder what the possibilities might be. Yeah, um, yeah, it, getting barley, Michigan grown barley into, um, into bakeries, into mills that are um, milling flour for human consumption is something I've really wanted to, to pursue for a long, long time. Um, but we're, you know, we're kind of locked into growing for malting and that with that comes a non-detachable hull. Um, just for traditional brewing techniques and everything. So it's it's hard to really, I'm gonna use that word pivot again. Um, it's hard to really pivot away from the value added that barley grown for malting brings um, and switch right into um, barley grown for foods consumption when we don't really have a much of a market um, for malting barley here in Michigan, but the market for barley for food purposes is maybe even smaller. I would, I would be confident and say it's a lot smaller. Um, but it varies by region too. So over by um, Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County area, um, people have a very different view on locally grown small grains than we do around here in West Michigan. Um, so, you know, the, the feelings I get from the community where I'm at are very different you know, once I leave my area. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, maybe it is worth revisiting that conversation with Bridget and getting um, getting some hullless barley over here. Lucia Dawson, or sorry, not Dawson, I just smashed two names, Gutierrez at UW is part of that hullless barley project. So if, if you would like to talk with her as well, just for someone who's a little more local. Yeah. Maybe you already know her, but. I met her briefly in person. Minneapolis some years ago. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, she's from Uruguay, right? Originally? I think that might be right. Yeah, I, I would, really struggle with Paraguay, Uruguay, one of those, <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's from Uruguay. Um, she, I was introduced, if I'm thinking of the correct person, I was introduced to her by Yari von Sitzewitz, who was at Sokobra at the time, but they're both from Uruguay. Um, and a way to tell them apart, the country is, is Uruguay is very developed and um, has a great educational system. And, mm. and Paraguay, not as, not as well developed. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so... All right, Lucia Gutierrez. Yeah. All right. I think if she had to pick a favorite grain, she is most excited about oats, but does do a good bit of barley work as well. Nice. Cool. Hey, Janelle, how is uh, Dr. Schreiner's uh, analytics lab coming along? Last I spoke with her, um, it's going pretty well. Of course, COVID put delays on just about everything. Yeah. Um, but as far as I know, she is acquiring uh, some equipment and has been starting to build out the lab. I don't know. I don't think that she was able to do the analytics on some of these projects for this year. But we definitely expect that by next summer, I, sh I shouldn't say I should, def I would expect because who knows what's happening anymore with the world, but, um, <laughs> but we would hope that they, that she would be like up and running definitely by, you know, next summer. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Yeah, and that's not, it's not a bad idea. Maybe I'll check in with her again soon and, and get a better idea. Sorry, I was scanning through. I thought she mentioned something. Um, there was an email chain going on the other day um, uh, where she had mentioned something about analytics, but I wasn't able to find what I thought was there and it might not have been there at all. 
Uh, it was about uh, detection of ferulic acids. Um, so I don't think it was really an update overall on, on the mm -hmm. situation of our lab. Okay, okay. We're excited about it. Um, we anticipate it's gonna be an excellent resource um, here in Michigan. So it's, it's a cool project. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, she's she's normally or occasionally on these calls too, but I know she's super swamped with um, teaching duties as anyone who is involved in any sort of way the school is right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, what was that? Uh, I had her scheduled as a speaker on one of our sessions, but it was wine day that day. Um, so she was racking some insane amount of wine and, and filtering and stuff. So. Um, yeah, so she's definitely staying busy. All right, um, so if there's no more questions, um, next week we have a uh, focus on spring barley. Um, so we'll have possibly um, some crop vlog videos of me when I was touring the sites up by Posen, so Presque County, Michigan, and also the Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center, UPREC, um, which were, in, and also KBS, we had the Eastern Spring Garley oh. Nursery at Kellogg Biological yeah. Station as well. Um, so hopefully we'll have some nice tidily edited videos for that. And, um, Otherwise, we'll have speakers, um, James Dedecker, so he's the director of UPREC. And then we'll also hear from Allison Babb from Empire Malting um, in Empire, Michigan, which is right up by um, Tandem, more or less. And um, also Gary West of West Acres. So he's a barley producer in Croswell, Michigan, so um, in the Thumb area. Um, and he's had really good success with spring barley over there. Um, Thank you everyone for being on this virtual happy hour and uh, thank you Janelle and Dean for speaking and um, thank you to everyone for engaging. I think this is the most like free flowing like group conversation where everybody collaborates we've had yet. Um, so I think maybe I'll try and like put people on the spot more in the future. It really well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep. Good. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Very happy to be um, on this call. Nice to talk with everybody. Yeah, great talking with you. Okay. And uh, cheers, everybody. Have a great weekend. And uh, see you next week. Cool. Great. Thanks. Thanks, nice guys. to meet you all. Thank you. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Janelle. Yeah.